We'll be considering a very important subject in this series, the doctrine of salvation. Why is salvation so important? Why is salvation so fundamental in our walk with God? Why is it so imperative that the subject of salvation is well understood? If we want to understand the plans and the purposes of God and give expression to them, then the subject of salvation will be very, very significant and cannot be overemphasized. The reason we study this subject is primarily for us to receive salvation into our spirits and also to us to aid us and to bring us to that point where we can fulfill the divine mandate that is upon our lives as we advance the purposes of God captured within the context of the will of the Father. God's desire is to be known, is to be desired, and is to be worshipped. Knowledge in this context is experiential. It's a knowledge that is only obtainable within the sphere and the atmosphere of intimacy is an experiential knowledge and that kind of knowledge what it does is that it imparts onto the one who is knowing the nature and the essence of the one that is known uh, you see words are deep or the depth of word varies for different language. The word knowledge in the Hebrew and the Greek is far deeper than the word knowledge in the English language. The word knowledge in the Greek is, for instance, divided into three broad categories, Ido, Epignosis, and Sophia. Ido, Epignosis and Ginosko. Ido simply means to be aware of a reality. Epignosis means to touch, to mingle and to interact with a reality. Why Ginosko? It's not just to mingle with a reality but to become one with that which is known. So in this context you understand that knowledge is deeper than the compressed expression given to it because it is condensed into the English language. So when we say God wants to be known, what it means is that God wants to, through intimacy and fellowship, be experienced by his creation until his creation becomes a replica of himself, carrying the totality of his dimensions and by so doing, giving expression to his will and his eternal purpose. If I say, for example, I know a man's wife, it's different from what the man means when he says, I know my wife. If I say, I know a man's wife, I know about the man's wife. I adore the man's wife. But if the man says he knows his wife, he does not just adore his wife, he epignoses his wife. That means he has carnal knowledge of his wife. You see, so that's a deeper sphere of knowledge. Idoring the man's wife does not produce anything, but epignosing the, wom the woman by the husband now produces a child. So that's the kind of knowledge we refer to when we talk about God wanting to be known. It's a knowledge that begs offsprings because it's experiential. It's a carnal kind of knowledge. And as the man journeys with the wife over time, they become, they look alike, you know, in a way, because they, 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 they are becoming one on account of continuous experiential knowledge of themselves. So this is the kind of knowledge God desires, that as we mingle with him, we know him experientially, we become one with him, and then offsprings are born out of that knowledge. And then the second thing God wants is for man to desire him. 
God wants to be desired. Over the age, if you study through scriptures, one of the things that stands out is a God that wants to be desired. A God that wants to be loved, to be craved, you know. And this is why many who made or did exploits in the kingdom were men that were after the heart of the Father. A dear man of God once spoke. He was carried to heaven and he went to a room. And entering this room, he saw a man reading. And when he looked upon the man, he knew he was Enoch. And Enoch lifted up his, his face and took him to another room. And he saw a handful of people there, all of them so focused, looking upon different books. And somebody lifted up his head and he knew that person to be Abraham. And Abraham walked up to him and told him, we are few here. And the man wondered why. They were communicating at the frequency of thought. And Abraham told him because here we study the heart of the Father. This is why we are called the friends of God. The greatest men in this kingdom are men that desire the Lord and pursue after intimacy with Him. God wants to be desired. David said in Psalm 63, from verse 1 to 2, He said, O God, Thou art my God, early will I seek Thee. My soul tested for Thee, my flesh longed after Thee, in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. This is a man that pleases the Lord. His greatest desire is the pursuit of God, the pursuit of intimacy. He, he, he seeks after God. In verse 2 of that same scripture, he said, the reason for this desire is to see thy power and thy glory as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. The power of God is the attributes of God. The glory of God is the essence of God. So he was pursuing God for who he is. And this is one of the greatest desires the Lord has. Men that pursue after him. God wants to be desired. A dear man of God wants to share with me. He asked the Lord, he said, what is it you want? And God told him, I want to be desired. If a man is healthy in the spirit, the hunger and the test for the Lord and his presence will consume him. It was Jesus who said, the zeal of my father's house have consumed me. That's what God wants. God wants to be desired. And thirdly, God wants to be worshipped. In John chapter 4 verse 24, the Bible, Jesus speaking, and he explained to us, John chapter 4 verse 24, he said, God desires to be worshipped. He said, they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. He said, for the Father seeketh such, for the Father seeketh such to worship him in spirit and in truth. God wants to be worshipped. And this three becomes the only basis by which man can give expression to the eternal purpose of God. The eternal purpose of God is God wanting to be contacted, contained, and expressed. Is God wanting creation to walk, to live in him, with him, and by him, so that he becomes the center and circumference of our reality. God becoming the core of our being. This is the eternal purpose of God. So, the reason for which God embarked on creation was for all of these possibilities to find expression that that being, that life force called man will know him, will desire him, and would worship him. As he knows him, desires him, and worships him, he becomes the container, the visible expression of his totality. By so doing, he can bring dominion to the face of the earth. Because dominion is actually devil who started 
that rebellion project in heaven brought it to the earth and the man failed to keep it so the man before the fall was an agent of dominion because he kept the earth under the governance of the spirit of god now the moment the man went the way of treason violating the laws of god the man fell what do we mean when we say the man fell i'm saying this to establish the reason for redemption i have said already that the purposes of god can never find expression except as the man knows god experientially constantly desires god to have fellowship with him and worships god continually thereby becoming an agent of dominion and i said for this to happen the man must bear the image and likeness of god the man must be in constant fellowship with god the man must be an agent of dominion this was the reality of the man but this man fell when he decided to yield to the devil in romans chapter 6 verse 14 verse 16 the bible said whoever you yield yourself servants to obey the servant of him you are whom you have obeyed so when man decided to heed to the voice of the devil he became the servant of the devil the man fell what is the meaning of the fall the first meaning of the fall is decline from glory in romans chapter 3 verse 23 the bible said for all have sinned and falling short of the glory of god what is the glory of god the glory of god is not just the appearance of light the glory of god is the nature the essence of god the substance that makes divinity is the glory of god and this man was made of that substance the bible said that let us make man in our own image and he said in the image of god he created him the word created is the word bara the man came from within god the man carried the nature the essence and the dna of god but when he went the way of the devil he became dust because he was a complex creation he had the dimension of god and the earthly dimension because in genesis 2 7 the bible said god formed the man out of the ground and he put the breath of the breath of god he put it on the man's nostrils the moment the man fell the man became a creature of earth he was falling he was declined from the realm of god's nature and god's likeness so the first impact that came upon the man that went the way of rebellion was the decline from glory the second thing that happened to the man was that he lost legality in the realm of god in genesis chapter 3 verse 9 god came into the garden as usual and he called out to the man adam where art thou what it meant was you know the man is an enthroned being in psalms 8 from verse 4 you see the psalmist asking a prophetic question he said what is man that thou art mindful of him what is the son of man that thou visitest him for you made him a little lower than the angels the word angels there is the word elohim and you crown him with glory and honor so the man is a crowned being the man is an enthroned being this is why god visits him so god came in genesis chapter 3 verse 8 to visit the enthroned being but unfortunately the man was no longer sitting on his throne where he ruled over the galaxies and the creations of this world so the man had lost his legal standing in the spirit his legal standing his rank in the spirit as an enthroned being as a coronated agent he fell from that realm so when god came god could no longer pick the vibrations of his energy the energy level where he was operating from he had fallen from that realm so god said we are down so the fall is actually a decline a dethronement of a coronated agent and you need to understand also that whenever there is a possibility of dominion there must be an enthroned personality because dominion is a function of decrees but the man had fallen so he had lost dominion he fell from the legal the legal stand he had with god the third thing that happened to the man was that he lost fellowship the man was a being having constant intercourse intimacy with god but god showed up and god could no longer pick his vibrations genesis chapter 3 verse 8 in the cool of the day the voice of god came walking in the garden but god could no longer have intercourse with the man the communion the connection the intimacy had been broken genesis chapter 3 verse 24 
God showed up. The intimacy had been broken. So God had to, on account of the fall, drive the man from the garden and he placed a cherubim with flaming sword turning on every side to keep the man from the tree of life. Because if the man takes of the tree of life, he will be eternally condemned. And if he's eternally condemned, there will be no hope of redemption for him. This is why the devil cannot be redeemed. He fell in eternity. He fell in a realm of perpetual continuum. He fell in an immortal state. So there is no way he can be redeemed. So God put the, 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 the cherubim to prevent the man from taking of the tree of life. Because if he eats of it, he will become immortally damned. And there will be no hope of redemption. And if there is no hope of redemption, the eternal purpose of God will be truncated. The fourth thing that happened to the man is that he took of the nature of the serpent. In John chapter 8 verse 44, Jesus addressing the fallen man, he said, You are of your father the devil. Ye are of your father the devil. And the lust of your father shall ye do. The nature of God is the nature of love. But the nature of the devil is the nature of lust. In 1 John chapter 2 verse 15, it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For they that love the world, the love of the Father is not in them. So the nature of the Father is the nature of love. In 1 John chapter 4 verse 17, he said, Hearing is our love made manifest, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. 1 John chapter 4 verse 7, God is love so you see the nature of god is the nature of god the nature of lust is the nature of the serpent so in john chapter 8 verse 44 jesus said the lust of your father shall ye do so man took the nature of the serpent this is why a child is deceptive not learning from anyone he has taken the nature of the serpent and then the fourth thing that happened is that sin Death and corruption entered the world. Romans chapter 7 verse 5. Sin, death and corruption entered the world. Eden was supposed to be a reflection of the heavenly environment. And man was authorized by God to cultivate and to keep it. Cultivation in, in this context is for the man to cause Eden to swallow up the totality of the earth realm. That means man was going to nurture Eden until every realm in this world becomes like Eden. The nature, the ambience, the environment of heaven. But unfortunately, man's fall opened up this realm to death. He said, for when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the Lord, did work in your members to bring forth the fruits, to bring forth fruits unto death. So the, the fall of man, the decline of man to the realm of lust and flesh opened up this realm to death and corruption. And finally, man lost dominion because creation was no longer under the will of God. Creation came under the dominion of darkness. In Romans chapter 8 verse 19, it said the earnest expectation of creation waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. For creation is in travail. Creation was basking under the will of God. The lions were feeding on grass. There was harmony. Creation was supposed to reflect the mystery of oneness. How that the chain of interdependence that create a bodily system like the church was the, the, the idea behind creation. But creation had fallen. So creation now rebels against man and the will of God. Man can no longer bring creation under the government of God. And man himself began to walk by the economy of darkness. He said in Psalm 82 verse 5, I have said unto you, ye are gods, because you are the children of the Most High God. But you will fall like one of the princes, because you know not. The man walks in the realm of ignorance. But the man before the fall walked by light. And that is why in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, it says, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, the, 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 the blood of Jesus cleanses us. What it means is, you know, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 19, the Bible said, Whatever name the man named the animal, that was the name there was. The word redemption simply means to set free, to bring freedom, because a ransom is paid.
Redemption can also be seen in the light of salvation. And the word salvation has two Greek origins, soteria and sozo. Soteria simply means deliverance. It also means preservation. And sozo simply means to be set free, to be saved from. So if you look at these compound words, redemption and salvation, you would realize that the idea is to restore the fallen man back to a place where he becomes the exact portrait of what was in the heart of God. That means spirit, soul, body is absolute expression of the nature and the likeness of God. And his greatest desire becomes fellowshipping with God through which he can have dominion. It's a restoration of Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Let us make man in our own image. That means the spirit, the soul, and the body of man becomes a reflection of the image and the likeness of God. And because of intimacy, the man can receive the blessings of God that gives him the power to bring his realm under the will of God, dominion. This is the idea behind redemption. And because of the effect of the fall, the protocol of redemption must of necessity be boisterous. The protocol of redemption is boisterous. And for us to understand this, I need to explain something very quickly. Everything God does generally and intrinsically, first of all, confers the knowledge of God. Everything God does is meant to make God to be known, to be desired, and to be worshipped. Therefore, redemption cannot be understood except we understand the progressive revelation of God, we understand the dealings of God in different dispensations, and then we understand the mystery of dominion. These three categories is what we give us the full understanding of the dynamic and the protocol of redemption. What do I mean? First, the revelation of God is progressive. What it means is that God is light, so you can interact with light in packets. You cannot even though you see light streaming as if it's an unending stream, it's actually in packets. It's called quanta. There are different packets. And the Bible calls God light. And that is because man must have to mingle with God and grow in his knowledge of God. Therefore, God deliberately fragments his revelation into packets and he can only be known progressively. For example, in Exodus, if you, if you study God, the healer, for example, or how God heals, or God's revelation of healing, for example, you are going to see that it is fragmented and it is progressive. You see, for instance, Exodus chapter 23, verse 25, he said, And ye shall serve the Lord thy God, and he shall bless thy bread and thy water, and he shall take sickness from the midst of thee. That means healing, the first revelation of healing is predicated upon your service of God. So if you don't serve God, you cannot receive healing. And then God migrates from there and God comes to another point. In Isaiah chapter 53 verse 5, he said, He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. What has happened? The revelation has migrated from serving God or doing something to, for, to receive your healing to trusting Jesus and what he has done in order to receive your healing. This is what was typified when Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. You don't need to do anything to be healed. All you need to do is to look upon the serpent. This is what was typified. So your faith in Christ procures you healing. At first, for you to receive healing, you needed to serve God. 
So your service is what procures you healing. Now you migrate to not just serving the Lord now, even though that's still important. You now receive healing based on your faith in Christ Jesus. And then Paul came and shifted it even further. And in Romans chapter 8 verse 11, Paul would say, If that same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead lives in you, he will quicken your mortal bodies. What is Paul saying now? Because the Holy Ghost is at work in you and you are conscious that you have the Holy Spirit, whether you, you make any declaration or not, that consciousness alone is enough for activating the healing power in you. This is what Paul meant when he said in Ephesians 3.20 that God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all you can think or say. You see that? So, he, revelation is progressive. You know God progressively. From walking to receiving healing, to believing in the finished works of Christ, and then to the consciousness of the Holy Spirit. Does that negate the first? No. The lesser is included in the greater. The lesser is included in the greater. A man who has the consciousness of the Holy Spirit we naturally walk serving the Lord because the Holy Ghost came to bear witness to the person of Jesus. So you cannot be conscious of the Holy Spirit and not serve the Lord. So you see that as we progress, the former is not left behind, but it is included in the latter. And then we begin to know God in a most holistic fashion. So the man who knows healing as a function of service is grossly limited. The man who knows healing as a function of your consciousness in the Holy Ghost both knows service, both knows the finished works of Christ and also knows the Holy Spirit. So that man has a more boisterous revelation of God than the one who just knows the first. So the knowledge of God is progressive and it is in this wise that we will deal with salvation. Take for example the subject of sin. Sin at first is the transgression of the law. But a point came where the Bible said, whatever is not of faith is sin. What does that mean? It's a progressive revelation. Transgression of the law today is still sin. But if you walk by faith, you will not transgress the law. And if you don't walk by faith, naturally you will transgress the law. So the man who does not, who walks by faith, does not transgress the law. This is why the Bible said, against such there is no law. That's the man who walks by the dictates of the Holy Spirit. That's a man of faith. So that man doesn't transgress the law. So the lesser is included in the greater. Now, this is why you cannot understand salvation unless you understand the progressive dealing of God in order to procure salvation. Secondly, the dealings of God with man is dispensational. In the era of the patriarchs, God dealt with the patriarchs purely by his voice. So they followed the voice of God and so long as they kept his voice, they were good with God. And God will relate with them as such. You study how that Abraham, out of fear, lied to Abimelech. And God would show up and tell Abimelech, you will die. The man whose wife you have taken is a prophet. The same happened to Isaac. Now, so long as Abraham was following the voice of God, Abraham was accurate before the Lord. You come to the era of the law. In the era of the law, you must have to keep the laws of God in order to be accurate with God. And then you come to the era of the spirit, where the only way you can be accurate with God is by your complete yieldedness to the Holy Spirit. So, it is a dispensational operation. You can hear the voice of God now, obey it, yet you'll be a man of flesh and you cannot please God. You can hear the voice of God now, obey it, yet you are a man building for yourself and God will not be pleased. The only way you can please God now is if you are powered by the Holy Spirit, motivated and empowered by the Holy Spirit that God approves of. You see that? So the dealings of God are dispensational. You need to know what God is doing part-time. What it also means is that God may be dealing with a generation by the voice of a prophet. You study the scripture, you see dispensational dealings of God. From the era of the patriarch, to the era of the judges, to the era of the prophets. You see, so in the era of the judges, the prophet, the prophetic was not there. 
and in the era of the prophetic the judges were not there so if you don't understand the dealings of god and align with the spirit in order to walk in that reality you will not be relevant as far as the agenda of god is concerned and you will not understand what god is doing as such no matter how strong you emphasize what you emphasize you may not be accurate so accuracy is not necessarily a function of your intelligent exegesis of scriptures accuracy in addition to intelligent exegesis of scripture is your ability to discern what god is doing part time he said the sons of isaac they were men that had understanding of the times and the seasons and knew what israel ought to do second chronicles chapter 12 verse 32 so the dealings of god are dispensational and finally every dealing of god and every revelation of god captured results in dominion it results in dominion and remember i said dominion is not just be fruitful multiply subdue the earth replenish it no i said dominion is our ability to bring our sphere of influence under the government and the governance of the spirit a man can have a family and he has 20 children it doesn't mean he has dominion a man with one child who is under the government of the holy ghost and become a tool in the hand of god is many times better than a man with 20 children who are lawless so dominion is not just multiplication dominion is actually bringing your sphere your context your aeon under the government of the spirit of god if we understand the progressive revelation of god the dispensational dealings of god and the strategic and significant role of dominion in all of this we will come to a point where the subject of salvation can be well understood now in order to deal with this i'm just going to share with us in this teaching the outline of salvation what i call the trajectory of salvation when god comes to procure salvation what are the things god does what are the pathways that the saved must walk in in order to attain to that point where he becomes a carrier of the image and likeness of god where he becomes a creature of intimacy and worship and he becomes an agent of dominion what is the pathway that the believer must follow what is that dimension of revelation and dealing that god brings in order to 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 save a man and make that man become an agent that fulfills his purpose and opposes his counsel this is what i want to outline very quickly in this class it's important for us to understand that god is not just love god is also just as such the judgment of god necessitates that every act of sin and rebellion must be judged the same way the love of god insists that god must be in fellowship that way the justice of god insists that iniquity must be judged so for the protocol of salvation to be understood for this pathway to be known we will understand how god separates the man from the world and then we'll also understand how god separates the man to himself the judgment of god is what separates the man from the world the love of god is what separates the man to himself these two sides of separation merged together is the trajectory of salvation so the trajectory of salvation includes the judgment of god the promises of god and the experience of god when we talk about the judgment of god what are we referring to Let, let's briefly examine three categories of persons in order to understand the judgment of god in the judgment of god basically this is what god does first god judges the world that is the context in which the man finds himself and then god judges the forces that keeps the man in captivity after that god now separates the man from the world the judged world and the judged forces that holds him in captivity god separates the man from that system that is what we call the separation from the world the second phase of judgment 
is where God begins to deal with the man in order to reprogram and to reconfigure the nature of the man. Because the fall, like you have seen already, caused a spiritual genetic mutation to the man. So God will, of necessity, re-engineer the man. So first, God judges the world. He judges the forces that hold the man in captivity. He separates the man from the world. Then God faces the man. God judges the man. God must judge the man because the wages of sin is death. So God must judge the man. When God is done with judgment, then the love dimension opens up. That is where the promises of God come in. So God will separate the man unto himself. It's a step of growing from a child to a son and to a father. And we are going to look at this boisterous protocol of prosecuting redemption by the wisdom of God. If we take the Old Testament, for example, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1 reveals that the Old Testament is a type and a shadow of the New. That means every reality in the New Testament is foreshadowed in the Old Testament. So you can, re you can know God, you can understand his dealings and his purpose from the Old Testament as much as you can from the New Testament. Because every scripture in the New Testament has its root in the Old Testament. Jesus affirms that, Paul affirms that, Peter affirms that. That's how the scriptures are. The scriptures are actually gateways into understanding the dimensions of God. So, if we look at the Old Testament, for example, to see how God prosecutes salvation. First of all, let's look at the first attempt God made, which is in the life of Noah. Noah is one of the patriarchs whose life was used as an experiment of what the project of salvation would look like. And if we look at the life of Noah, in Genesis chapter 6, when evil on the earth had climaxed, we saw that God decided to judge the world. And God did not only judge the world, God also judged the perpetrators of evil in the world. Remember, I told you God will judge the world. He will judge the forces that keeps man in bondage and then he will separate the man from the world and then he will judge the man. See that? So God judged the earth when he opened the fountains of the great deep and the windows of heaven and flooded the earth. God judged the Nephilim, the giants that perpetrated wickedness in the earth. They were killed. They were every, the Bible said all flesh was destroyed. So God judged the world, judged the forces that perpetrated evil and God separated Noah by the instrument of the ark. So why God judged the world and judged the forces that held sway in the negative direction? God was separating Noah. So God separated Noah through the ark. And the moment God, Noah came out of the ark, God began to give him commandments. God began to give him commandments. That means God will judge the man, bring the man to align with his government. And God will never take matters of alignment for granted. The reason is because the realm of God functions by order. Without order in the realms of God, the will of God can never find expression. The realm of God must function by order. So this man was taught the way of alignment. That's where Noah was judged. And Noah was realigned back to God. And after that, Noah began to dominate the earth. So Noah blessed his children and Noah began to multiply. So it's from judgment into the blessing. If you look at the life of the patriarch Abraham, who is actually the bedrock of salvation. Bedrock, not in that he prosecuted salvation, but the project of salvation began prophetically with him. If you look at the life of Abraham, God judged the world. Abraham's grandfather Nahor was a prince of Babel in Genesis chapter 11. You saw that God saw and said, let us come down and see what they were building. And God confounded their language and they were scattered. So God judged that world. What that world was about was to build a tower to be like God. They wanted to make a name for themselves. So God judged that world by scattering them. So that was not possible. And then God 
judge the princes of that world. Nimroy the great hunter and all his princes were destroyed. And then God separated Noah. In Genesis chapter 12, he said, Get thee out of thy father's house. Get thee out of thy country, out of thy kindred, out of thy father's house, unto the land that I will show you. So God must separate us. Every man that God uses, God separates. Every man he must separate. Now, if you don't understand this, when God begins to work on your life, you may want to rebel because you would not know that the protocol of salvation is already in motion. So when God judges your system, you may be doing living in a corrupt system and God comes, he collapses. And then you are crying, Lord, this business is my only business. No, salvation has come to your doorstep. Salvation has come to your doorstep. Um, a dear friend of mine was running an online ministration, people streaming in, and a dear sister who happened to live outside of this country mistakenly shared a picture that conveyed a part of her nakedness from her chest region to her face. Now, this is not this example is not given to spite her, but I want to use this to illustrate something. Now, that was the business she, she lived by. That was what sustained her as a person. She sold her body in order to survive. Now, salvation had visited her. And the only way God could judge that system was to allow that to happen. And her word came crumbling. There are many people who are in all forms of treacherous businesses and all of that if god wants to bring salvation he will judge that word and everything will collapse you will pray there will be no answer what is happening is that salvation has come to your doorsteps and when god does that god now separates you from that world so abraham was separated from his his country his kindred his family remember this is foreshadowing what will happen in the new testament and when God separated Abraham, in Genesis chapter 12 from verse 6 and 7, the Bible said, Abraham came to Sikkim onto the plain of Moreh. The word Sikkim is the word shoulder. The word Moreh is the word teacher. What it simply means is that God is beginning to break Abraham and judge him. In the days of old, they carried their bodies on their shoulder. So God began to teach Abraham by bodies. What God was doing was judging Abraham's flesh. And you will see that God, Abraham would not enter into the promise until Abraham came to a point where he could believe God. That was when Abraham was detached from his kindred, from his country, and from his father's house. He could trust God. And it was at that point that he entered into the promise. And in the promise, Abraham began to grow from a child. And God would give him instructions to circumcise himself and his household and Abraham will grow to a son where Abraham can fight to defend the interests of God. Abraham could stand to, to negotiate with God about the verdicts of nation. That's sonship. And then Abraham will come to the place of fatherhood where Abraham will enter into absolute intimacy with God. And his life will no longer mean anything to him but his relationship with God. To the degree that Abraham will be willing to sacrifice Isaac in order to be accurate with God. So Abraham migrated from a point where he could receive the blessings, a child, to a point where he could legislate and advance the will of God as touching nations and territories. And Abraham got to a point where God was all that mattered. Not even his son Isaac mattered. Intimacy, the place of fatherhood. So that's the trajectory of salvation. If you take Israel, for example, you'll see the same thing happening in the book of Exodus, God judged Egypt. Exodus chapter 14, verse 13. You see how that God judged Egypt. The first judgment God brought upon Egypt was that God gave favor to the Israelites and he spoiled the Egyptians. So every wealth that was in Egypt was carried away. And as if that was not enough, the strong men of Egypt and Pharaoh that pursued after Israel. God drowned them in the Red Sea. In Exodus 14, 13, And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, 
stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he shall show you today. For the Egyptians whom you see this day, you shall see them again no more forever. So God judged Egypt. God judged Pharaoh. And in Exodus chapter 12 verse 12, he said, Tonight I will pass through the land of Egypt, and I will smite the firstborn of the land of Egypt. Meanwhile, that's the third way God judged Egypt. He spoiled the Egyptians, he killed their first sons, and he destroyed their mighty men. And he said, both male and beast. And again, all and against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. So God did not only judge Egypt, God judged the gods of Egypt. And when that was achieved, God separated Israel. If you study the scripture, 14 verse 9, let me take it from there. You will see that the children of Israel were murmuring as the chariots of Pharaoh approached. He said, but the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army and overtook them, encamping by the sea beside Pihahirot before Baal-Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. And they were so afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord, and they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us, to carry us forth out of Egypt? They were rebelling against what God designed for them, and they were talking and murmuring against Moses. Is not this word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, let us alone. So they were telling Moses, we told you in Egypt, leave us alone. So they were murmurous. But at this point, God was not yet dealing with them. God was judging Egypt, judging the gods of Egypt, and was attempting to separate them. So flesh was allowed. God will begin to deal with flesh when he separates the man from the world. So the moment they crossed the Red Sea, and listen to something, in, in Exodus 14 verse 30, the reason why God judges the world, judges the forces of this world, is so that his name can be honored. Exodus 14, 17 and 18. And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them, and I will get me honor upon Pharaoh. So the reason God judges the world and judges the forces of the world is so that he can be honored. But when God separates the man from the world, God begins to judge the man. And the reason God judges the man is because no flesh shall glory in his presence. The man is his vice regent. The man is the vessel through which his purposes can find expression. But if flesh is not dealt with, the man can glory in flesh and say it's because I was strong. So God will break everything in that man that gives him inspiration, motivation, and empowerment apart from himself. That is what God does. And the moment Israel crossed the Red Sea, you begin to see the judgment of God against Israel. None was spared. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 49 to 51, Moses was judged. Moses, the ranking deliverer, speak to the rock that it will bring out water. And Moses struck the rock twice. He rebelled against the word of the Lord. And in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 49 to 51, God was speaking to Moses. He said, Get thee up into the mountain Abarim, unto the Mount Nebo, which is in the land of Moab, that is over against Jericho, and behold the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel for a possession. Next verse he said, And die in the mount whither thou goest up. God told Moses, go to that mountain, see the land, you will not enter, die there. Imagine God sends a man to a location and say, go there and die. Why would God do that? He said, and be gathered unto the people as Aaron thy brother died in Mount Hall and was gathered unto his people. Verse 51. Because you trespassed against me, among the children of Israel at the waters of Meribah Kadesh in the wilderness of Zin, because ye sanctified me not in the midst of the children. So you saw that before the Red Sea, God forwent 
and could forgo flesh murmuring. But after the Red Sea, God begins to deal with flesh. God will judge everything flesh in our midst. Moses is symbolic of our stature in the spirit. He was prophet, he was judge, he was king, and he was a god. Yet, God will not allow flesh. He was judge. Aaron, the high priest, Aaron is symbolic of our priesthood. Aaron was judge. Numbers 20, 23 to 29. When, you know, Aaron also rebelled against the Lord, you will see all of that in this scripture. Numbers 20, 23 to 29. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in Mount Hall by the coast of the land of Edom, saying, Aaron shall be gathered unto his people, for he shall not enter into the land which I have given unto the children of Israel, because ye rebelled against my word at the waters of Meribah. So in Aaron's case, God did not even do it in hiding. He said it should be done publicly. Go on. Next verse. He said, Take Aaron and Eleazar his son and bring them up unto Mount Hall and strip Aaron of his garment and put them upon Eleazar his son and Aaron shall be gathered unto his people and shall die there. And Moses did as the Lord commanded and they went up into Mount Hall in the sight of all the congregation. And Moses stripped Aaron of his garment and put them upon Eleazar his son and Aaron died there in the top of the mountain. And Moses and Eleazar came down from the mountain. And when all the congregation saw that Aaron was there, that means God did it in the sight of the congregation. There is a dimension of flesh that God deals with publicly, especially when it has to do with priesthood. So God judges it publicly. The reason is because flesh can never have allowance. Remember, we began by saying the purpose of creation is for God to be known is for God to be desired and worshipped and by that dominion would find expression that means bringing everything in creation under the government of God if flesh exists that is not possible so God destroys the flesh so Aaron who is symbolic of priesthood was judged Miriam was also judged Numbers chapter 12 verse 1 to 16 they rebelled against the authorities that God institutes. Moses took an Ethiopian wife and they spoke against him. And the anger of God came down and Miriam was struck with leprosy. And God, Moses would intercede for, for Miriam and God would say, if a father spit on the face of the child, would she not be shamed? And Miriam was separated from the camp for seven days. A leprous person is completely white. The skin, oh my God. Miriam was a ranking person amongst the tribe of Israel, in the camp of Israel. But this ranking prophetess was stripped because flesh needed to be joined. All of these are revelations to tell you that God will never tolerate flesh. Any aspect of your life where flesh rules is that is an aspect where the will of God will never find expression. It's an aspect where God will never tolerate or accept. Aaron's sons were also judged. Leviticus chapter 10 verse 1 and 2. Every act of flesh will be judged. So God will not only separate you from the world or judge the world and the forces of the world. God will judge you. He will kill the flesh. And I will show you all of that as we begin to deal with these subjects in subsequent classes. He said, Anadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. Which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Which he commanded them not. This is to reveal to you the standards of God, how rigid God is. There are many people that will never enter into experience because they violated the demands of death to flesh. They did not go through the wilderness. The wilderness is that place where God allows circumstances to turn a man to trusting and relying on him completely. That is the place where a man yields to God and God breaks the powers of flesh. Korah, Nathan, and Abiram. Numbers 16 verse 1 to 40. These were 
these guys are symbolic of gifted but rebellious people what was their crime they violated authority because they felt they could also hear god you see that happening today most of us preachers who are gifted oftentimes become arrogant and rebellious because of giftings they must be judged and the earth swallowed them up at the instance of Moses' prayer. They were judged. The 12 spices that went to survey the land, Numbers 13 and 14, they were judged because they had a different spirit. Only Caleb and Joshua made it to the promised land with the generation born in the wilderness. Why? They had a different spirit. The ones that carried the spirit of Egypt were destroyed in the wilderness. And finally, Israel herself was judged in Numbers 16, 41 to 50. After the death of Korah, Nathan, and Abiram, Israel rebelled against Moses and the Lord. And God destroyed 14,000 of them in one day. God will not tolerate flesh. In your journey of salvation, your flesh will be judged. At one point or the other, before you come into the experience of God, flesh must die. If you look at the life of Jesus, who is the pattern man, he also mirrored this dimension. Because the Bible said Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. Jesus is the pattern man. And Jesus will reveal to us the protocol of salvation. Because himself went through it so that we can follow. He is the author and finisher of our faith. He is the pattern to look upon. He said, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He is the pattern man. And how did Jesus do it? Jesus naturally was separated from his world because he was committed to the Father from childhood. He said, I will go about my Father's business. But before Jesus entered into the fullness of his ministry with the Lord, he went through the wilderness for 40 days. And in the wilderness, Jesus revealed to us the three dimensions of flesh that must be judged. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And Jesus will return, and the Bible will say he returned in the power of the Spirit. And Jesus will enter into the fullness of his reality. Paul, the great apostle, also passed through this pattern. Many things will he suffer for my name's sake. And then Paul will go to the wilderness of Arabia. And that was where he downloaded all of the mysteries of the kingdom that he returned with. And Paul would come back to become the great, one of the greatest of the apostles. So, when God judges the world, judges the forces of this world, he separates you. If God separates you, God begins to deal with the flesh. And as God is dealing with the flesh, God now brings you into the economy of his love. I told you God separates you from the world and he separates you unto himself. He separates you from the world by judgment, he separates you unto himself by love. And the first economy of God that avails us the possibility of entering into the fullness of God is the economy of his fatherhood. The word father is the word fundus. The word fundus is the word foundation. That means God becomes your stamina. The word father is the word pater. The word pater is the word nourisher. That means God becomes your sustainer. That's what fatherhood is all about. So in the context of fatherhood, we see the love of the father. For structure that is revealed to us in the fatherhood of God. The second thing we see is the mercy of God. And the third thing we see is the faithfulness of God. The love of God imparts unto us the nature of God. The mercy of God brings us the preservation of God. And the faithfulness of God imparts unto us faith. Because God is faithful, that's why we trust Him. Now, the love of God, the mercy of God, and the faith of the faithfulness of God is the triangle that makes for the fatherhood of God, the love of the Father. The love of the Father stands on three pillars. The first pillar is god's mercy the second pillar is god's faithfulness and the third pillar is god's righteousness god's righteousness god's faithfulness and god's mercy is the pillar that the love of god stands on and the love of god is the, re the representation the expression of the fatherhood of god because that's where god makes for all of the wants of man now we will deal with that subject as well in details and then you migrate from that level, you now come to sonship. In sonship, you begin to know God by taking responsibilities. In childhood, you know God by receiving his provisions. 
in sonship you know god by taking responsibilities and in fatherhood you know god by intimacy you know god by mingling oneness you know god by experience that can never be explained but can only be communicated because you have known him you have come to his realm so this is the fundamental trajectory of salvation where god separates where god judges the world he judges the forces of this life he separates you from the world he judges the flesh and then he brings you into the economy of his love and the first economy of god's love is the fatherhood of god and in the fatherhood of god i told us upon which the love of the father stands is the righteousness of god the faithfulness of god and the mercy of god it is in the righteousness of god that you see the mystical triangle of forgiveness of sin justification by faith and the wrath of god that's where it is balanced it is in the mercy of god that you see the strategic intelligence and infrastructure that god put god puts in place in order to provide preservation for man he said in lamentation 322 because of his mercy we are not consumed and it is in the faithfulness of God that we build faith experientially. After which we come into sonship. And in sonship we take kingdom responsibility. And responsibility in this context is priesthood and rulership. Priesthood and rulership. And we would explain all of that with time. And then you come into fatherhood. In fatherhood we enter into intimacy. This is why in 1 John chapter 2 verse 12 to verse 14 he said, I write unto you children because your sins are forgiven and you have known the father provision i write unto you young men because the word of god abides in you and you have you are strong and you have overcome the wicked one i write unto you fathers because you have known him you have ginoscored him that is from the beginning the trajectory of salvation is separation from the word and unto separation unto the lord separation from the world to separation unto the lord this is the trajectory of salvation and this protocol captures the judgment of the world the judgment of the forces of this life separation of the man from the world the judgment of the flesh the economy of god's love where his provision dwells sonship where you take responsibility and then you come into intimacy if you go through this protocol three things happens to you the first thing that happens to you is that you know God experientially in his multifaceted dimensions. The second thing that happens to you is that you are transformed into the God kind of being. And the third thing that happens to you is that you become an expression of the will of God, thereby becoming an agent of dominion. Thank you. God bless you. In our next class, we'll be looking at the first layer in details which is the judgment of God on the flesh how God deals with flesh and then we'll progress from there father thank you for your word we receive your engrafted word with meekness and Lord we ask that these words take root in our hearts and provide a hundredfold harvest to the end that the emphasis of your spirit communicated will become a living reality in our lives. In Jesus' precious name, amen.